So I'd like to introduce our set elder, our set man, the guy called out by God to lead us in the direction of his choosing. I love, love you, you, Pastor Mike. I love you, too. I love that shirt, too. Vermont Wild. I am born to be wild. That should be our theme song. Because I wasn't born to be a tame, nice guy. I was tamed to be a world cha- I was I was changed to be a world changer. You guys weren't listening. I was changed from the person I used to be who was not a nice guy. I was changed into somebody who's supposed to be a world changer. Catalyst. We're supposed to be wild. We're not supposed to be tame. Um, we, we should be kind and we should be meek and we should be gentle and we should be humble and all of those things. But uh, you know what word's missing from there that uh, most people think Christians are supposed to be? Nice. Kind, generous, loving, giving, meek, humble. Those are all good things. And just so you know, I have a word for, where did Gary Loomis go? Gary Loomis. He left the building. He left too early because I have a word for him. Oh, well. Okay. This message today, just so you know, um, sometimes you plan things and they don't happen the way you planned them. Anybody relate? So this week I worked on an outline. I had an outline all ready to go. I had it all finished on Thursday like I'm supposed to have. And Yesterday I start looking for that outline. I didn't find that outline. I think I know where it is now, but it's a little late now. So I believe that the message that I had prepared on Thursday wasn't the message that God wanted to bring today. So, be ready in season and out of season. Hopefully this message comes across in some kind of a coherent fashion so that it makes sense at least. Gary, there you are. I have a word for you. It's not a big word. I believe that the Holy Spirit was telling me to tell you that he hears you. He knows. That's it. That's all I got. It's enough. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this wonderful, awesome time that we get to have together with you. God, thank you for community. Thank you for the baptism today. Thank you for the, for the lives that are being changed by your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that as we talk this morning, that your Holy Spirit would come and that you would encourage each one of us, you'd challenge us, you'd do whatever you want to do. God, I pray for healing, for deliverance, for salvation, for whatever it is, God, that you want to do by your Spirit. And God, I pray that you would create a unity within us that we've never known before that we can make a difference in this region, in this world, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a continuation of our series. This is part, uh, what part is it? Twelve. Twelve out of like 16 weeks. You know we're already a quarter of the way through 2016? Time goes by fast when you're having fun. And today's message is entitled Alignment. Um, anybody here ever get into a car and start driving down the road and you just get this sense that something's not right? If you drive a car every day, you, you kind of get the feel for that car. And you get in that same car and, and something's not right. Well, Michaela has a car, and I didn't ask if I could use this example, but this last winter, she had a little bit of an incident, not a big incident, um, it was very slippery one night, and she's down in Burlington, and she tries to go straight, and the car does I mean, tries to turn, and the car doesn't want to turn. Anybody ever been there? So you just kind of hold on and pray. And she hit a curb. Not a big deal. Didn't blow the tire or anything. But the next day, I find out that something wrong with the car. It doesn't feel right. It's driving funny. So I get it, and I guess it's driving funny. I didn't even dare to drive it. I drove down down the road about a half a mile and turned around, came back, and it's like, I wouldn't drive that thing across the street. There's something wrong with it. And you're driving down the road, and, uh, and you could turn the wheel, but the wheel didn't turn. You know what I mean? So you got this little bit of play, well, about three inches of play in the steering wheel. It's like, whoa, this is interesting. You don't want to drive very far that way. 
So the next day, I took it to, to, our, to our mechanic, and um, on my way there, I'm praying. Every, every car I'd meet and every big truck I'd meet, especially, it's like, whatever's broken, don't let go now. Because something's broken, and there's a tractor trailer coming at me at about 60. Come to find out, she broke a tie rod, and or something, I don't know. It's all Greek to me, anyhow. One of those pieces underneath there. And that needs to be replaced, but then it's out of alignment. And a car with one wheel out of alignment will drive funny. And it will cause damage to your tires and to your car, and nothing's good when it's out of alignment. Only that one, that one wheel of being out of an alignment about like this. It's really funny because when I ran, went around the corner with it, that tire evidently didn't turn like the rest of them, so it squealed all around every corner. It's like, but we got it fixed. It's only like $150. Could have been worse. But my point is that a car out of alignment is not something you want to continue to drive. A church out of alignment is not something that I want to be a part of. How about you? I want to be in a church that's in alignment with, we're in alignment with what God's doing, we're in alignment with each other with what God is doing. And today's message really is about vision, but making sure that we're aligned with the vision of the house. And so I don't forget to say this, I want to say it now. As we go forward, you know, Dominic Corvo has been such a blessing to me. Just so you know, Dominic, you've been such a blessing to me. He's made me dig deeper, and he's made me think differently. That's always a good thing. And one of the things that's coming out of, out of my relationship with him is my thinking different about y'all. See, we are the body of Christ. That's not changed in my heart and mind. But I want to, as we go forward, even as we talk about vision, I believe it's my responsibility as the set man, and I believe it's the elders' responsibility as the overseers to get the vision from God. However... This is where the change is. We want to be listening to what God is saying through you as well. Um, I don't want to be the top down, this is the way it is. I want it to be a coming together so that we're all on the same page, that, that you got buy-in because, because you're, you're part of the decision-making process. Does that make sense? So if you're a member, you're going to be heard. We're going to give you an opportunity to speak and to have a voice if you're a member. If you're not a member, then... Well, that'll have to be another discussion for another day. So today's message is about vision. And I believe God has given me a vision. And my message three weeks ago, the dream releaser message, I don't know if anybody else was challenged. Maybe it was just for me. I'm still being challenged by that message. That message really challenged me to ask God, okay, my personal life, what's my vision? What have you called me for? But then the next step... The more important step, if you will, is this church. Why is, why is Catalyst Church on Raceway here? Why did God put this church here? Isn't that a good question? Isn't that something that we should wrestle with continually to, to make sure that we're knowing why we're here? He didn't put us here just to be a beautiful building on a, on a street in Jericho. He put us here as a people for a purpose. And we have, to, we have to come to a place where we wrestle with that long enough so that we understand what it is that God has put us here for so we can be about what he's doing. So I believe he's given us a vision, and in that vision, there's this... <laughs> so let me, let me take that back off from there so, you don't, so I don't get ahead of myself. I, I, this, this last week, well, these last few weeks, but this last week in particular, I really was convicted because I haven't even talked about vision to you at all since the beginning of the year needs to happen more often. Last Sunday we were at New Beginnings, my papa's house. Um, what's really interesting there is changed so much from when we were there. And honestly, there's, there's a lack of vision, and it's obvious. And I'm not sharing anything that's not known. There's a transition coming, and when transition happens, just like at the Life Center for the last few months, I'm sure that it's been kind of where are we going, what's, what's going on. When Phil gets installed there, there's going to be direction, there's going to be vision, because you have to have a leader to bring vision. And Pastor Rick and Carmen are all over the place. They're traveling here and there, and, and uh, just got back from the Philippines. Um, but it's obvious that when, when the vision isn't there, things aren't the same. 
So it's my fault that, that we're not talking about the vision, about why we're here enough. It's not nobody's fault but mine. We, we all need to be reminded of why we're here continually. I actually wrote out a paper this week, and the title of the paper is My, my Outrageous Vision for Catalyst Church. Because a God-sized vision should be outrageous. It shouldn't be something that we can do. It should be bigger than what we could think we can do. It needs to be something so big that if God's not in it, it doesn't happen. God needs to be in our vision. Strength of any vision, though, lies in the alignment. First, the alignment with God. If it's not based on His Word and His heart, if, if, if our vision as a church isn't based on the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, then we're missing it. When Jesus says this is the greatest commandment, shouldn't we take that into account of why we're here? We're here to love God and to love people. We're here, the Great Commission, we're here to tell others about Him and to make disciples. That's pretty simple. The how is the question, I guess. But, but if we're not in alignment with Him to start with, there's no strength in the vision. If we have a vision to do this, that, and the other thing, they could all be good things. But if they're not God things, then we're missing it. And then secondarily, and just as important, however, is if we're not in alignment together, it will never happen. If, we got, if we've got a hundred different visions and a hundred different agendas, we're not going anywhere as a group. A vision caught and shared by every person involved. So as I share vision, I'm, my prayer is that you catch it. That then, we, then we have a discussion about, okay, how does this work? How are we going to fulfill this vision? Is this vision what God wants us to do? Does it need to be refined? So it's not coming from me, this is what we're going to do, but it's coming from me, this is what I think we're supposed to do. Come with me and figure it out as we go. A shared picture of a preferred God-designed future. That's, my, that's a great description of what a vision is for a church. As we get together and we share a vision for what, God, what we think God has called us to, then we can come together and we can lock, lock arms together and make it happen. I can't do it alone. And actually, I don't think that even if three quarters of us were bought into this vision, I don't think it's going to happen. It's going to take all of us. And a vision without alignment means little. We could have the biggest vision in the world, but if we're not aligned with God and with each other, it doesn't mean anything because it's not going to happen. There needs to be a singular vision. So even as I share about wrestling through it, at the bottom line, the end of the day, there needs to be one vision. One. When you have more than one vision, what do you have? Division. If we have multiple visions, we end up with division, we end up with all kinds of issues. Division, by the way, according to one um, source, means a disagreement between two or more groups, typically producing tension or hostility. Hostility. Anybody ever been in a group where there's division? And I'm not talking about personality conflicts, I'm not talking about interpersonal relationships, I'm talking about we as a group think we should go this way, and there's other people in our group that think we should go this way, you end up with tension. And it boils down to sometimes hostility. And the Christian church should never get to the point of hostility. There's healthy tension. Healthy tension is a good thing. When we disagree on, on little things, we can have tension. That's a good thing. I want healthy tension in our eldership meetings. I don't want a bunch of yes men. I want there to be this, this interchange of ideas that, that says, ah, that might not be such a great idea. Synonyms, did I say that correctly? It's always one of those words I get caught on. Disunity, disunion, conflict, discord, disagreement, dissension, disaffection, estrangement, alienation, isolation. That's what happens when there's more than one vision. Those things happen. Amen? Does any of us want those things? I don't want those things. And if you want those things, you probably should see a counselor. Honestly. Honestly. Because no human being should want disunity and disunion. We should be looking for that place where we can come together. 
If people are causing divisions, Paul wrote this to Titus, who was set in as an elder and apostle. Um, he said, if people are causing divisions among you, give them first a first and second warning. After that, have nothing to do with them. See, Paul took division pretty seriously. There's another place where it says to mark them, to note them. If they're, if they're teaching doctrine that's contrary to the doctrine that you're, the true doctrine, then you mark them, you have nothing to do with them. Division, people who cause division in a local body are more dangerous than the sexual sinners that we all get worried about, by the way. With multiple visions comes. This is what happens when you get multiple visions, all those other words, plus you get agendas and you get politics. Is there room, really, honestly, in the church for politics? When we have a meeting together, should there be politicking? Where you're trying to convince people and manipulate people and buy favor and all that stuff? No. That's not how a church should ever be marked. For you guys that are guests, I'm sorry. I wish that I had a real... The, the other message that I had prepared was really awesome. It was about becoming who you are, and that's kind of my theme in life anyhow, but uh, this is what God gave me for today, maybe for a reason. You will, we will not have a healthy body, but a chaotic gathering. When a body comes together, there's unity, there's form, there's function. You, you realize that you're not all alike on purpose. You realize that this person has these strengths, and these, this person has these strengths, and they're different. That's good. You don't want um, a hundred me's. We don't want a hundred Heathers. I love Heather. She brings energy to the place. But can you imagine? It's like that song, I can only imagine. I shouldn't sing like that, should I? I'm all right. I got permission. <laughs> Dissension which ensures failure. And you know, God put us here. God put this church here. Long before I was here, this church was here. Long before almost all of you were here. Sandy was a number one original, right? You're a plank holder. Joe and Hazel were plank holders, yes, no, right at the beginning. Scott and Nancy. Anybody else here? Huh? Mike and Brenda? Well, I can guarantee you that if you were to ask them, how'd this church come about? Well, you know, we thought it'd be a good idea. No. I can guarantee you at the beginning, there was a lot of heartache, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into to establishing a church in Jericho. You know, we take it lightly because it's here. It's been here. It's established. Praise God. But we don't want to ever discount the, the energy and the pain and the suffering that went into ensuring that it would survive. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Literally, what this verse says, just so you know, literally, it says, where there is no prophetic revelation, people do whatever they want. So where there is no vision, where there's no leader saying, this is where we're going, nobody knows where to go. There's nothing more dangerous than a peacetime army. Because what happens? There becomes all these dissensions and fights among, amongst themselves. And I see it in the church. If the vision's not clear and we're not going somewhere, then we start to look at each other and say, well, how come you're not? No. It's because we don't know where we're going. We don't know why we're here. If we know why we're here and we know what we're doing, we can put aside petty differences and we can charge forward with each other. I never knew this verse was here. 1 Corinthians 14, 8, in the middle of this whole discussion on speaking in tongues and everything, there's this little verse. If the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know that they're being called to battle? If the leader doesn't say, let's go, how does the church know where we're going? If, if I and the elders don't have a plan and a purpose that we can set forward before you, then how do you know what you're supposed to be doing? Do anybody else know this verse was there? I mean, I've read that passage. I've taught on that passage, and I literally never saw this verse before. But doesn't it make sense? And in its context, it's saying, you know, if you speak in tongues and nobody can understand you, what good is it? So if, if the bugler is bugling 
but nobody knows what they're bugling, then what good is it? If, I be, if, if we get up here and we call revel, rev, revelry, rev, relev, how do you say that? Yeah, like she said. Then we all know what that means. It means wake up and get going. Philippians 2, 2 says, Then make me truly happy. Paul's, Paul's writing a letter to the church in Philippi. He says, Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. One mind and one purpose. Not with 30 minds, not with 10 minds, not with 20 purposes. One purpose. Everything that we, need, that we do as a body needs to have one purpose in mind. And that's been true since day one of the Church of Jesus Christ. When that gets diluted and it gets watered down and it gets too many, too many things going on, then the church becomes this um, museum instead of a movement because nothing's going forward. Finally, and Peter says, all of you should be of one mind. D do you get it? We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. It's not about my agenda or your agenda. It's about his agenda. And why did he come? He came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to bring restoration to a lost and dying world. He came that we might have access to the Father. Let's have his mind. The strength in any vision lies in alignment. So we could get up here and I could cast a vision that's like, wow, yes, that's awesome. But if we don't come together and put our, put our shoulders together and move forward together, it will never happen. And we'll find ourselves right where we are now, five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now, not fulfilling the very reason that God put this body here. Why did he put this body here? Well, I have a catalytic ver vision. I like that word, catalytic. See, you're all called to be catalytic converters. It's supposed to be used by God to bring conversion into the world, bringing people from death to life, from the mud to the rock. Why is more important than what or even how about this vision, though? So before I talk about what the vision is, let's talk about why there needs to be a vision. And I don't know, maybe some of you remember that, that uh, this number. Anybody remember this number, 97%? 97% of Vermonters, according to the North American Mission Board, which is part of the Southern Baptist Churches, says that 97% of, of Vermonters do not have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know, even if they're wrong and they're off by five or six points. So when you read the obituary, the older you get, the more apt you are to read obituaries, by the way, I've noticed. Because all of a sudden there's more people in there that you know. When you read those obituaries, statistically, one, one out of 33 is heaven-bound. That's pretty sad. That's why. Because we live in a state that's dark. We live in a place where, where God has been removed from our society. And it's obvious, to me at least, that we're in need of an awakening in this area. Is that obvious to you? I mean, if you look around culture, uh, is culture in good shape? We've got, we've got young people dying of heroin addictions. You think the state has the answer? state doesn't have the answer. Give them, some, give them some legal drugs instead of illegal drugs. That's not the answer. The answer is a changed heart that no longer needs the drug. They're set free. They're delivered. The great commandment in itself is, an, is reason enough to have a vision and to move together towards it. The great commandment, if you love Jesus, you're supposed to obey his commandments. His commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That's it. And then the great commission. He told you, not just me, he told you, if, you're, if, you're a, if you consider yourself a follower of Christ, if you call yourself a Christian, he told you to go into all the world and make disciples. 
He didn't, he didn't say, hey, hire somebody to go in your place. He didn't say, you know what, I've chosen a few people to be missionaries. They can go. You stay here and play house. He didn't say that. He said, go. The Great Commission. Maybe, you, maybe we should be thankful that he didn't send us to Africa or Asia or wherever it is that other people are sent. But you know what's interesting? Percentage-wise, Vermont is in more need than most places on earth. And of course, our mission statement, if you're a member of this body, this should be, you should memorize this. This should be what you're about every day, not just when we get together. This should be your driving force in life, is to be living proof of a loving God to a watching world that some might come to know him. And the word know there, it's an English word, but if it were Greek, it would mean to know him experientially, not just to read about him and have heard about him, but to know him through your life. When a person comes to know him, they're changed from the inside out. Just be thankful. I'm thankful that it wasn't from the outside in. Nobody came to me and gave me a bunch of rules that I had to live by. Nobody told me I had to quit drinking. Nobody told me I couldn't go to the bar anymore. Nobody told my wife that she couldn't play bingo. Nobody told us any of those things. The Holy Spirit changed us from the inside out, so we, the desire to do those things just kind of floated away. See, when God does it, it's not something you have to do. It's just you've changed. You become like Him instead of like you used to be. So when a person comes to know Him, there's a change in their lives. Now, I want to I just stretch your bubble a little bit and ask you, since you've come to know Him, have you changed? Maybe you haven't changed as much as you hoped. Maybe, maybe you haven't changed so that we can see it, but have you changed? Has your worldview began to change? Have you, do you see things differently? It's not my place to judge whether or not you've come to know him. But you should be concerned about it. If you don't have any visible change in your life, you should be concerned about it. What happens then? Marriages are saved. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, God healed our marriage. God did something that only he could do. He took two people, not just one, two people, and changed their hearts towards each other and towards him. And the ones that don't need salvation, they're renewed and they're strengthened. Marriage, healthy marriages are the most important part of a healthy culture. Children are raised up in a loving home instead of a broken home. Why? Because the parents' hearts were changed healing of souls and spirits. There's deep things in some of us that need healing that no person, no doctor, no psychologist, psychologist, no drug, no nothing is going to get into there because it's a deep spiritual wound that only God can touch. And he wants to touch it. And then there's healings of bodies as well, but uh, that's not as important because we're all going to die someday. But the healing of your spirit and your soul, that's important. So that you become a different person. I've become a different person, believe me. I think even in the last few years, I've become a different person again. Maybe you don't agree. Would have been a good place for an amen. <laughs> There's deliverances from addictions. There's deliverance from, from patterns. We sing this song, Jesus breaks every chain. He does. Now, sometimes we're bound by, by invisible chains that they're no longer there, but we don't realize it, so we continue in the pattern that we've been in. We don't have to because he set us free. He changes our lives. He doesn't just change our lives, though. He changes our family trees. He changes our future. He changes our legacy. That's, what ha that's why there needs to be a vision because there are people all around us. Believe it or not, there's 100,000 people within a 10-mile radius, radius of us right now. Can you imagine that? 100,000. Out of that 100,000, how many do you think know Jesus Christ in the way that's bringing them to salvation, changing them from the inside out? 3,000. If the statistics are right. If they're, if they're wrong and it's, maybe it's, maybe out of that 100,000, maybe there's 10,000. That means there's 90,000. We've got a mission field. That's why. Is why important? 
My, this is what I titled my paper that I wrote, My Lofty Outrageous Vision for Catalyst Church. So this is not thus saith the Lord. This is just what I think God has put on my heart, and really nothing's changed. It's been added to, but nothing's really changed. Number one, I see an intentional pathway from people to go from being guests to members to servants to leaders. And you know what the different the key word there is that we have not had? Intentional. Everything, now this is my fault. This is nobody's fault but mine. Since I've been here at least, it's been kind of whatever. We're moving in a direction where it's going to become more intentional. Somehow, I can't do it. The elders can't do it. The elders and deacons can't do it. We need to do it. I see people, a people-driven ministry versus a program-driven ministry. In that, I mean that the people of the church own the outreach ministries. They're not centralized, but empowered to go to be flexible. So God puts a mission on your heart. And, he's, and I'll use Paul McGarry and the, and the New Place, for example. God put this on Paul McGarry's heart. So Paul McGarry has this burden. So why not let Paul McGarry run with this burden? Why does it have to go through the office and become some official ministry? No, it's the church. You are the church. You're supposed to be doing these things. Now, keep this in mind, though. If we're going to go where we're going, even though we're all kind of doing our own thing, they all have to be pointed in the same direction. There's a reason why Paul's doing this. It's to be living proof of a loving God to a watching world so that some might come to know him. There's a reason why this last night, they didn't bring shepherd's pie or they didn't bring pizza again. They didn't bring some ordinary meal. They, bought, they brought beef stroganoff. When's the last time you had beef stroganoff? Oh, I like beef stroganoff. If it's made well, it's good. And I bet it was made well. I see teams doing ministry together that will, by default, make disciples. Now, this is, this is something I'm going to be presenting to the members as we go forward, this whole team concept, and we're going to have discussion over it. Um, I'm excited about it. Every time I look at it, every time I think about it, I get pumped because I believe it's a vision from God on how to do church here at Catalyst. So there'll be more information coming. I see this building full with hundreds in attendance. There's an S under, after 100. And it's funny because I'm in the shower this morning, and, and I think God was speaking to me. Now, it wasn't an audible voice, so don't write letters and say I'm nuts. But I do believe that he was asking me a question because I'd written this out. And the question he was asking is, are you willing to do whatever it takes? He's asking me that. And you know what? Honest, can I be honest with you? I'm struggling with it. Because what happens if he wants us to do a Saturday night service? I don't want to do a Saturday night service. I like my Saturday nights. I usually go to bed early because I get up at four on Sunday mornings. But you know what? I've got to answer that question, don't I? I can't ask you that question if I don't answer that question. Am I willing to do whatever it takes to make this vision happen? So as I struggle with that question, I'm asking you to struggle with that question. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to make this vision happen? So if we end up with a Saturday night service and we have the, the worship team playing Saturday night and Sunday morning, you and the worship team, are you willing? It's easy for you to say, you're not on the worship team. <laughs> It's a serious question, but it's one we have to wrestle with. We, see, I think, honestly, the reason God asked me that is because I kind of like a 10 a.m. Sunday morning service that we're all done and gone home and have lunch at a normal hour. I kind of like that. I've done the two-service thing before. Two services on a Sunday morning. We started at 7 and ended at 1. That's a long day. Am I willing? Are you willing to do whatever it takes? I see small groups of all kinds, each one with its own flavor and outreach, cell group in nature. Now, see, here's something that Dominic and I have been talking about and we've talked about with the elders. Every single person in here, I think, without exception, would say that community is important to them. They know that they need to be in community with each other, that discipleship is important, that community is important. Small groups are important. 
yet every time we try to do small groups it fails so I'm still looking for the answer to that I think it goes back to the question for each of us of priorities myself included am I willing to do what it takes to, to get what God wants to give us through community because it's going to take a, a sacrifice because it's going to mean that at some point during the week you're not going to have those two or three hours to yourself you're going to lay them down for the body are you willing to do that if that doesn't happen the rest of this will not happen this is key because as we grow in numbers on a, in a gathering like this if, if we don't have community then people are just going to fall through the cracks and out the back door because they're not going to be knit in and they need to be knit in we need them they need us I see a daycare and I know the state the lady from the state told me it's not a daycare we don't take care of days it's child care I see a daycare in this building in full operation we're talking 50 60 kids is that impossible it's impossible unless the right people are here and say yes because you have to have X for education and you have to have this and that and the other thing but if the right people are here saying yes it could be happening now so pray that the laborers would be sent forth because that's what we're missing now I'm getting out future here this probably won't happen this year but I see several satellite churches across Vermont New England and beyond and you know what's really exciting about this this is an idea that I've had for a while however I really thought this was probably just one of my things but you know there's a guy in southern New Hampshire that planted a church six years ago it's the name of the church is next level Easter Sunday they had 5400 people in seven locations and they started six years ago they just bought another building in North Conway New Hampshire eighth place opening how does that happen in New England it takes somebody with a vision that's got people in alignment that's willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen I see a school of ministry with pastoral interns gaining real-life church ministry experience because one of the things I've seen with intern programs is they take young people they take people whoever it is and they take them and they put them in a cocoon in a secluded cocooned Christian environment that's not realistic to start with we don't do ministry in a cocoon surrounded by Christians even in the church if you're going to be trained up to do ministry you need to be in the real life garbage ministry is hard work sometimes and to be cocooned for several months around other believers and all patting each other on the back and just experiencing worship for 12 hours a day wonderful but it's about as close to real ministry as nothing it's, you know I'm a person just like you I need to I need to have the same disciplines you do and there's not 12 people around me saying come on let's get together and worship we can worship for four or five hours I see that as vital to the church in America becoming the church because there's a dearth of leaders and there's people in this room right here right now I want to say this prophetically that are called to be leaders in a church and there's no vehicle because they need to go away to school they need to do this no they don't that's not that's that is a vehicle but it's not the only vehicle the church should be raising people up to be pastors and teachers and evangelists and apostles and prophets the strength in any vision lies in alignment if you get nothing else out of this understand that the strength in any vision lies in alignment so this vision that I've presented it's huge it's outrageous it's lofty it's crazy but it's absolutely nothing without alignment people need a vision but a vision needs people and if you're a part of this church if you're a member of this church this in some way shape or form is the bones of the vision are you going to be able to get on board be intentional and do everything that you can to make it happen 
I've been reading a book by Wayne Cordero. The name of the book, if you want to read it, it's really pretty good, is Doing Church as a Team. And he writes this, We must all have the commitment to jump into the things of God with reckless abandon and get wild with him. Isn't that amazing? Or for him. So Ben wears this Vermont Wild shirt, and I have this quote that he didn't know anything about. We need to get wild for him. We must have the passion to do whatever it takes. We must be like the disciples of Jesus and say, we're going to go for it. Are we willing to go for it? Or we want to sit around and let somebody else go for it? Jesus died for those 90,000 people that surround us, by the way. The strength in any vision lies in alignment. Intent alone will not make the vision pass, come to pass. There's an old saying, the path to hell is paved by good intentions. I should, you know, one of the things I'm always curious about, where does this stuff come from? But isn't it true? I mean, good intentions will get us nowhere. There needs to be doers. We need to, one of the problems I've seen in the church, in this church in particular, I've not, I don't know much about other churches, I don't go there, but I've seen a lot of people who think they got great ideas, but where's the doers? Where are the people who are willing to do whatever it takes to make the vision come to pass? I can think all day long, it doesn't cost much. So, Together, we need to pray. And you know, it's, it's frustrating. Wednesday night, we have prayer meeting, and there's four or five people there. Pray. We as a body need to be a praying body. We need to pray because this is a huge vision. It's way bigger than what we can do. Pray. All of us can pray. That would have been a good place for somebody to say amen. All of us can pray. You don't have to have a, a degree. You don't have to even go anywhere. We need people to partner. And, and in partner, I don't mean just shake hands and say, I'll be there for you. I mean be there in every way. Because this, it's interesting because this is, a, this is a church, right? This isn't a business. So we don't have a partnership. We are a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. But we're a church before any of that. And as a church, this is up to all of us. So when I say partner, I'm just saying you do your part in the partnership that God has already designed you to be. Because when you do your part, I do my part, and she does her part, and he does his part, then we see growth. We see the church become what she's called to be. And participate. Even if you're new and you have no idea what's going on, participate. Even if you're not called to be the small group leader, attend one. It doesn't take a lot. All it says is, instead of watching Survivor tonight, I'm going to go to my small group. How? By God's grace and power, because I know this, through our weakness. When we run out of power and energy, His power gets turned on and we have the ability to do anything. But not through me, through y'all, through all of us. When we all say yes, when we're all in, when we're all all in, each member doing its part. And here's the, the last verse. Now, gl all glory to who? Who is? He's able. I love this verse. It's one of my favorites. Through his mighty power at work within. Did you, did you hear what you just said? Within us. His power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So according to this verse, my vision's not big enough. Because he's able to do more than I can ask for, more than I can think, more than I can imagine. I got a big imagination, but I got a bigger God. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for each one. Um, every one of us, whether we raised our hands or not, God, I pray that your hand of protection would come upon your church. I pray that we'd be known for many things. First, how much we love you and how much we love each other and how generous and meek and mild and humble and wonderful we are as your followers. Uh, we'd be known for our convictions, but not for what we're against, but what we're for. And God, I pray that we'd also be known for, for wisdom and for health and for good stewardship of everything you've given us. 
And God, I pray that our reputations in the world would reflect you. And God, part of that is our bodies. God, I pray that you would heal us, that you would protect us. God, I pray for each one who's, who's had a cold or a virus or whatever else is going on. God, I just pray that your hand would be upon this body, that we would be healthy as a people, that we'd be about your work for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.